I'm preaching something the Lord put on my heart, and, and this has been, I'll be honest with you, it's been quite a while since I've just preached a word that's not in a sermon. Um, so you're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to shout me down a little bit this morning. You're going to have to get a little bit alive today. Come on. How many of you are alive in the house today? Ten of you are alive. The rest of you are still, you know, coming up out of your grave. Um, but I want you to write this down if you're taking notes, please. Abiding in rest. Abiding in rest. Now, this is probably not going to, it might be an atypical first of the year kind of message. Um, but as, as, I was, as I was studying and I was praying, I felt like this is what the Lord put on my heart. Please, if you've got your Bibles, why don't you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 3. And we're going to go uh, a few verses. There's a lot of scripture in here today, but this is where we're going to start. This is in verse 7, and we're going to go to verse 11. It says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. On the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. And that this, is, this, this last part is kind of, I want to key on this a little bit this morning. It says, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. They shall not enter my rest. I'm going to read this one more time because I feel like it's really, really important. It says, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. On the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Consider that just for a minute. How many in here have witnessed a real miracle? Now, I don't, I don't just mean salvation, because salvation is a great miracle that we've all seen if you come to the knowledge of Jesus. I mean, like, you've seen blind eyes open, you've seen deaf ears hear, you've seen someone get healed. Anybody seen a miracle in the house? Come on. I've seen a lot of miracles in my life, but, but I have to say, you know, I, I, read, I read stories out of the book of Exodus, and I don't think, I, I don't know that I've ever seen anything quite like that. Not just, not just the ten plagues or, or these other types of things, but imagine a scenario for a second in which the provision of God came into your life every single day miraculously. Like you woke up, you walked outside, and there was just randomly a loaf of bread on your front doorstep. You woke up, you walked outside, there was, uh, you know, the, the, the milkman came, but there's no milkman anymore. You feeling me? You, you woke up, you walked outside, and everything that you needed to persist for that day was literally right on your front doorstep. See, these are the kinds of miracles that the children of Israel walked through for 40 years. They were out in the desert, and everything that they had, they received from the Lord. See, we're not just talking about, we're not talking about just a scenario in which the, the, the grace of God had come upon them and that in, in itself was the miracle. No, every single morning they saw the miraculous provision of God. And yet at the end of this, what does it say? It says, but they always go astray in their hearts because they have not known my ways. Because for every miracle that they saw, they didn't perceive the reason. It never hit their hearts. How many, how many of you recognize that you don't deserve a miracle? Does anybody get that? It never really hit their hearts that they didn't deserve what they were receiving. And because of that, because they had, a, because they had an attitude of entitlement in it, they were not able to enter into the real promise of God, which was the rest of Canaan. Okay. Okay. Come on, let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, right now, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds. God, in fact, this morning, I pray, that, I pray that we would be receptive to what you want to say today. Lord, I pray that we would be receptive to, to your Holy Spirit this morning, to all that you want to, to bring into our midst today. God, I thank you for your word. I pray that you, would, uh, that you would allow it to be released with its full impact into our lives. God, we love you. We worship you. We give you all the honor in your name we pray. Amen. How many of you enjoy rest? Now, now some of you, that, that word rest doesn't, it doesn't sit well in your spirits. I'm not talking about idleness. I'll be honest with you, there was a, 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 several months ago I had, a, I had a day off where I had literally nothing to do. Anybody ever notice that sometimes in moments of idleness there's actually less rest than before? 
where you're sitting there and you're, you're, you're trying to determine, you know, what project you can do. You're trying to figure out what it is that you could put your hands to, but you just kind of, you end up just sort of twiddling your thumbs and, and by the end of the day, you think to yourself, wow, I really wasted that day. Anybody ever wasted a day not on purpose? See, sometimes when we think of rest, we think of idleness. I'm not talking about idleness. I'm talking about the kind of rest, the kind of, the kind of feeling, the kind of contentment that comes in your life, whether you're working or not. The kind of, the kind of, the contentment that is on you, and when it gets into you, it doesn't matter how much you've worked or how little you've worked, you still feel satisfied. I like that kind of rest. Here's the, the definition of the term, rest, is to abide, to find rest, or to find a home, a fixed abode. Now, I'm going I'm to read this one more time. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways, and as I swore in my wrath, they shall not rent, enter what? My home. My home. See, in the Old Covenant, the rest of God was the promised land. It was that he was taking them from a place of slavery, and he was bringing them into a good land that even though they'd have to work, you know, it's funny, the Bible mentions a land of flowing with milk and honey, but when the, when the Israelites got there, what they found was a land filled with bees and cattle. Are you feeling me? See, sometimes our mentality is, is that when God's provision comes, there's going to be no work involved with it. That's not what he's saying. When he's saying, I'm going to take you into a good land, he's saying, I'm going to take you into a place where your work is going to mean something now. I'm taking you into a place where you're not working for someone else. You're working for your own benefit, your own profit. This is, what, this is the land that God had for them. Now, in the new covenant, our rest is the person of Jesus. He is our Sabbath. When we're talking about entering rest, because I feel like this is a really important message at the beginning of the year. How many of you are resolution people? I'm going to be honest with you. I'm kind of a resolution guy. I'm a very times and seasons oriented person. So much so, and, and this is the exact opposite way to do a diet, so please don't do what I do. If I know I'm going on a diet, I think, you know, I look in my fridge and I say, you know, I'm not going to have carbs for three months. See, the thing is, you can't let all the carbs in your fridge go to waste. Right. <laughs> See, so what I do, because I'm a times and seasons oriented person, if I'm starting on Monday, I'm going to tell you Sunday afternoon is going to be fried chicken Sunday. Okay? This is going to be the day where I take in 8,000 calories and spend the next three weeks burning off the calories that I ate because I don't want them to go to waste. I'm a times and seasons oriented person. See, I am a person, when I look at my year, I look at, the, I look at the previous year and I say, what do I need to improve upon? You know, I, I try not to get into the whole guilt, shame kind of thing where I'm like, oh, I'm just a terrible person. No, I try to look at my life and I try to say, this is an area of concern for me. I need to make a, a significant effort in the next year to change it. Yeah. See, the problem is this is that if I look at all my resolutions like solutions, but, the, but, but I don't have my focus entirely and primarily on pursuing the rest of Jesus, my solutions are not solutions, they're just distractions. I'll be honest with you and say that most people are resolutions because they're not centered around finding more of Jesus, getting deeper into the heart of Christ, and pursuing more of the presence of God. Our solutions rather become distractions for the next year. And we find ourselves 12 months later in the exact same spot we were before. I want, I want you to just listen to, to, to how David sees the work of God in his life. This is Psalm 91. I'm going to read the whole thing because it's just really good. It said, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, My refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. 
For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Listen to this. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place. The Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. And this is the Lord speaking this to David, and David is putting this on paper. He says, Because he he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. I I, got to read this one just real quick to you. I'm not going to read the whole thing back again, okay? But just bear with me. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place. No evil shall be allowed to befall you, and no plague will come to your tent. How many could use a little more of that in your life? This is what we're talking about this morning. How do we enter into the rest of Jesus? Well, first of all, it's it's, it's kind of simple. How many of you know that a lot of things in our life we really overcomplicate because we assume they should be? You know what I'm saying? Like, life is, is fairly complex. Like, there, there, are some, there are some things that are really, really simple, but most of life, to be perfectly honest with you, is really complex. That's why most professions require some form of training, whether that's college or trade school or some sort of on-the-job thing. If you're going to make significant amounts of money, you're going to end up having to get training for something that's kind of complex. Like, I got into the trades, I'll be honest with you. I, I got into construction, and, and, and I just, you know, when you watch building happening from the outside, you just kind of see walls going up. And, you know, I mean, ever, anybody ever, like, drove by somewhere, and then you drove by a week later, and, like, it was, like, half built? See, our minds tell us, well, that must be really simple because I'm seeing just from the outside. But when I actually got into the trade, I realized I'm really bad at this. I, I recognized that there was a there was a certain level of training and, and experience that I didn't have. That some of these other guys that were on my crew, they would you know they tell me how to do a bevel cut and all this kind of stuff, and, and I and I'd stare at them like I'm I'm really smarter than 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 you see me right now. I really am fairly intelligent. One day I'll get this. I'm going to be honest with you. I just never was a construction guy. I never quite got it. You know what I'm saying? I I just I talk for a living. So I'm just, I'm a lot better at talking. (laughs) Listen to this. This is A.W. Tozer. He said, when religion has said its last word, which means when it has nothing else to say, when it falls flat on its face, how many of you, how many of you ever had religion fall flat on its face in front of you? You, you, you kind of get into it, you get really religious because you assume that religion equals spirituality and spirituality equals knowledge and knowledge somehow equals closeness to the Lord. Now, when religion has said its last word, there is little that we need other than God himself. The habit of seeking God and effectively prevents us from finding God in full revelation. In the and lies our great woe. If we omit the and, we shall soon find God, and in him we shall find that for which we have all our lives been secretly longing. If you want to enter into God's rest, you have to seek him from the place of desiring more of him, not God and something else. Let me, let me, let me, let me put, like, maybe just run this around for you. Pentecostals tend to get like this. We tend to think to ourselves, I really need to get, I, I need to, exercise my giftings more. You know, if, if, you have a, if you have a gifting of the prophetic or maybe uh, a gifting of healing or exhortation, your mentality is, is that, you know, to get closer to God, sometimes my idea is, is that I need to exercise my gifting more because exercising your giftings is what pleases God. How many of you know that's not true? 
Well, I believe that God is pleased by the exercising of spiritual giftings. I don't believe that that's the primary reason why God is pleased with you. In fact, the idea that using your giftings to please God, that, that's actually what we would call an orphan spirit. Because what an orphan does, as he says to himself, if I take what I'm good at and I exercise it in front of my father, then I'll have favor. The more I do, the more the father will love me. Friend, I've got to tell you, whether you've ever exercised your giftings or not, God loves you and he's pleased with you. No amount of the exercising of giftings is going to make God love you more. On the other side of that, the religious, the religious person might say to themselves, uh, you know, I, I really need to read my Bible a lot more this year. Do you need to read your Bible more? Probably. The average American, statistically speaking, reads their Bible for like five minutes once a week. But on the other hand, is reading your Bible more going to get you closer to the Lord? Not necessarily. There are people who read their Bible all the time that don't know the Lord. And it's because what we're doing is we create these resolutions that are designed to get us closer to the Lord, but we, we, we use the method as the, as the way that we're going to do this. But somewhere here in our hearts, we still haven't figured out that our desire is not more of the Lord. It's for people to see us or even God to see us and say, wow, you're doing a great job. I'll be honest with you, I'm not really worried about doing a great job spiritually. I mean, I, I want people to look at my life and I, I, wanna, I want them to be able to say, you know, you're growing in maturity, you're growing in giftings, all these things. That's wonderful. But if that's what I'm living for, that's not more of the Lord. If that's what I'm living for, if what I'm living for is, is people looking at my life and saying, wow, you're growing a lot, but my relationship with my father is not growing, I have entirely missed the whole point of getting more into the Lord. We don't seek the Lord from a place where we're saying, God, I want to get better at this, or I want to get better at this, or I want to get better at this. We have to get to a place where the primary reason we seek the Lord is because we just want more of him. Instead of being goal-focused, resolution-focused, etc., we find ourselves in a position where our greatest focus is the pursuit of Jesus. And when we do this, we find that the other peripheral goals begin to take care of themselves, or rather, the strength and the ability of God flows into you, making the impossible into the inevitable. Friend, if there's an impossible situation in your life, maybe what you don't need is you don't need another five-step process. You just need more of the Lord in your life. You know, the interesting thing about God is that when people have sought him wholeheartedly, he has never hid his face from us. But just from personal experience, I find that when I've tried to change my life on my own so that the Lord would be pleased with me, I find, I find myself not only failing, but being disappointed. You ever found yourself in that position? You made a resolution, and much like every other American, six weeks into it, your gym membership, you're still paying for it, but you're not going to the gym anymore. You bought that treadmill with your tax return, and by July, it's kind of become another shelf. You, you bought that weight set, and by March, it just accuses you from the other side of the room with cobwebs on it. You know what I'm saying? How many of you, like, you ever, you ever, you ever had, like, your, 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 like, personal fitness equipment accuse you? It is amazing how judgmental an inanimate object can be. When you haven't used it for a long time and there's, like, the itsy-bitsy spider has made its home between, like, you know, between the 25-pound the weight and the 30-pound weight, yeah. it is amazing how judgmental your weights can be. Or you sign up for that gym and it texts you every week because you haven't like, you haven't like clocked in and it says, hey friend, it's not too late. And you're like, don't talk to me again. <laughs> Put them on the don't call list. <laughs> See, I find myself when I don't purposefully access the strength of Christ, consistently disappointed and generally in a worse place than I was before I made the resolution. Have you ever considered? Yeah, 
I won't go there. But we'll go. I'll do it second service. I'll have more courage. I want to I talk this morning about the thieves of rest. The thieves of rest. See, I'm not going to give you a five-point intro on in how to get into the rest of Jesus because it's actually quite simple. Seek the Lord with all your heart for no other purpose than to seek the Lord. This is how we enter and access the rest of Christ. It actually should be as simple as anything else in our faith. We seek the Lord for the sake of seeking the Lord. But here's some things that really get in the way of it. Number one is unbelief. Hebrews 3, 9 through 10. Once again, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. The sin of the Israelites was not that they needed to be rescued. I, I feel like I need to tell you that because I, even as I was putting together this message, I, I just felt like the Lord, the Lord wanted me to hit it shame real quick. If you're in a spot in your life where you need to be rescued, but you're holding back because you're concerned about how God is going to react to your cry for help, there has never been a time in the scripture where someone has honestly cried for God's help and he said, I cannot believe how ashamed of you I am because you are in need of rescue. God is not concerned about your need for rescue. Their sin was not that. Their sin was that God rescued them and the entire way they refused to believe that he was able to do it again. Think about it. Every single morning, they woke up to God's provision. And every night, it seems like every time they turned around, when you read the histories, of the consistent attitude of unbelief. You brought us out here to what? Listen to this. What did God bring them out for? To take them in to a promise. To take them in to salvation. What did they say he did? He brought us out here to die. If he wanted them to die, he would have just left them in Egypt. They would have eventually died. He brought them out to live and they accused him. Think about this. God did something good and they accused him of evil. God worked in miraculous ways and they refused to acknowledge him as being a good father. Be like a spouse, whichever, whichever one of, whether it's your, your, the husband or the wife, whichever one of you is the, you know, is the main breadwinner. It'd be like, it'd be like a, the spouse continually, every time the, you know, the 15th and the 30th comes around, no matter how many times you'd, you, you had, you'd come through, no matter how faithful the provision had been, every single time your spouse makes, you know, makes some sort of, uh, you know, makes some sort of statement or claim that you're not going to come through this time. I mean, how awkward would that get in a house? Where no matter what you tried to do, no matter how you tried to love them, they would never see what you were doing. But it was always this continual defamation of your character. There's nothing worse. I mean, if you just think about it relation, there's nothing worse then going out of your way and doing something for someone because you love them. But every time that you do something, they say, is this it? Wow. Thanks, I guess. Unbelief will rob your rest. You know, the really interesting thing is this, is that as they were going out into the wilderness... You, you would imagine that a people who didn't have to do a whole lot of work, that didn't have to farm for their food, that essentially didn't even have to make their own clothing. The Bible says that, that for 40 years their clothing didn't wear out. The Lord was so, he, he, he was bringing them into a season where he was so trying to, trying to knead into their spirits. And when I say knead, I don't mean knead. I'm saying like kneading like dough, okay? You're trying to get this in here. Anybody ever made bread? You know what I'm talking about? Okay. I've made bread like once. You like that? That was nice. <clears throat> it was terrible, by the way. I did a really bad job. He was trying to get into their spirits by, by almost a, uh, just a flood of miraculous provision. He was trying to remind them of the God that he is 
Every single day, I'm going to provide for you. Every single day, I'm going to make a way for you. Every single day, I'm going to lead you. But no matter what he did, you, you know, you'd, you'd almost think that this would be the most carefree, loving group of people in the entire world. Because they literally had to do nothing and got everything. And yet over and over and over in the scripture, the sound coming out of their community was, man, it'd just be better if we were back in Egypt. You know, they had oranges back there. Oranges are amazing. You know what I haven't seen out in the desert? An orange. Unbelief in God's ability to provide for your life will put you into a state of constant stress. Stress is the opposite of rest. You know, friend, I, I don't know about you, but I can, I, I can look back at times, whether by, you know, happenstance, quote unquote, or even miraculous provision God has provided for me. But I tell you what, there are, there, there are still times in my life where I have to remind myself of these things. How many of you know that, that no matter how God has come through for you in the past, there will always be another season where you need to remind yourself of how God has come through for you? See, the issue is, is if we continue in unbelief, no matter how many times God provides for us, we'll never enter into the comfort of knowing that he loves us and he's there for us. We'll always fall back into the position that says, I have to do everything for myself because God doesn't really love me the way he does other people. Number two, complaint. Ooh, complaint. Exodus 16, 13 to 15 says, In the evening, quail came up and covered the camp. And in the morning, dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. And when the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? It's what manna means. Essentially, it means, what? I love this. They see God's provision. And rather than being like, this is incredible, miraculous, God has literally thrown stuff on the ground for us to eat. Their whole mentality was, ew. What is it? Ooh, manna. Man. How many of you have ever tried something new on your children? You know what I'm saying? Like, you went out of your way and, and like, I'll, I'll, I'll just give you, my, my kids, uh, my kids, I feel like, and I could be wrong, and maybe my kids are just uber picky, but... Um, my kids sometimes don't have appreciation for the finer things in life. I was at Safeway a few months back, and you know, every every couple of weeks, you know, one of the things I love about Safeway is that their meat department has redonkulous deals on like steak. And they had a uh, they had like a rib roast, which is like my favorite kind of meat in the world. Like I'll I'll put all kinds of stuff on it and just make it absolutely incredible, right? And they had it for like four dollars a pound, right? And I, I, I'm, I, as I'm seeing this giant roast, right, and, and in my mind, I'm envisioning all kinds of stuff. Like, I'm like, I'm envisioning French dip sandwiches and, you know, epic steaks and all this kind of stuff, right? I mean, my, my mouth is watering in the store. I probably looked like an absolute savage. Anyway, so I buy this giant roast and I bring it home and I, you know, I doctor it all up as I am wont to do. And I go to serve it to my kids my son looks at it and is like, can I have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? <laughs> and I'm sitting here trying to explain to my three-year-old why he should eat this steak, right? Like how amazing this is and how privileged and honored he should be to get this basically this giant, you know, like, like Flintstone style, like slab of meat. But over and over, I mean, this isn't even the only time. Over and over in, in the scriptures, we see that this is what the Israelites did. Because their hearts were not grateful. They were entitled. And so they saw the provision and the miracles of God as what they were owed. 
not what God's grace was giving them. Does that make sense? If there's anything I feel like the Lord has convicted me on in the past year, it's that I sometimes have a tendency to be critical and I sometimes have a tendency to complain. But the truth is, is that there are very few times, if ever, in Scripture where complaint has yielded a godly result. Does that make sense? See, even when it has, even the Israelites experienced this. They, they, they still received, they still received the provision of God because God is a covenant-making God, but he wasn't happy with them. There was numerous times where their complaint, their, in some ways their manipulation tactic, because that's what complaint is most of the time, is a manipulation tactic. Their manipulation tactic might have worked, but it didn't actually reap what they should have wanted, which was the favor of God. Friend, I got to tell you, if you're tired of being anxious, you got to stop complaining first. The problem with the eyes of complaint is that no matter what you receive, there's always some way to look at it poorly. Let me just give you an example. Husbands, if you've ever done this, please don't ever do this again. If your wife comes in with a new dress and she's asking you how she looks in it, you don't tell her, well, you look really good. I wish your hair was nicer. No. See, complaint, complaint will always give you a reason to complain. There's always something to be upset about because nothing in life is perfect. How many of you have ever received something from the Lord that you needed but you didn't want? See, sometimes provision doesn't come in the form that I'd like it to. And I have one of two options. My first option is to look at it and say, what is this? And, and to be fair, here's the thing. I don't, I, I, part of me loves like reading these stories so I can think about what not to do. But how many of you know that as we, we sometimes look at the scriptures and we judge people in them and say, oh, I have never done that. But the truth is we're like this. This is why we preach this way, is because the human nature, we are not given to generosity. We're not typically given to anything except complaint and criticism and lack of trust. This is who we are. Now, when we come into Christ and he gives us a new nature, we we begin to shift our minds, but that doesn't mean that we can't slip back into the old nature. If we're not careful, everything about our life, there's always something to complain about. You see it on social media all the time. President Trump cuts taxes. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden there's people that will be wildly not in favor of what's happening. Or President Obama raises taxes. This is, of course, when he was the president. And no matter what benefit or what cost it is, there's always a reason to complain about it. We have to really be careful about this because I, I got to tell you that sometimes we think that when we're pursuing righteousness or, or we screw up or whatever, there, there are some times that we, we think of like trying not to screw up in the quote unquote big things. Like, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to step out of my wife or I don't want to, you know, like do one of those, you know, these other types of things. And of course, all of these things, that's true. You would never want to do one of those things. But the reality is that we give ourselves a pass on things like gossip and complaint. We give ourselves a pass on the fact that our attitude actually doesn't reflect the righteousness, peace, and joy of the Holy Spirit. Because complaint is normal. It's normal to complain about everything. Throughout the journey, the Israelites complained their way through miracle after miracle after miracle essentially crying out, woe is me, when the clothes on their back literally never wore out. I want you to hear this. They squandered their salvation, and they returned to a form of slavery that kept them bound as surely as their shackles ever had. Complaint is slavery. It's a form of bondage. See, the issue for the Israelites 
was that God had taken them out of Egypt, but Egypt was still in them. See, their, their physical shackles were gone, but their internal shackles remained. Because they'd gotten, they'd gotten free of the land, but they'd never left the land in their hearts. Number three is disobedience. Jonah 1, 5, and 6. And I, I never really thought about it this way, but listen, this is uh, Jonah 1, 5. It says, Then the mariners were afraid, and each one cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. <laughs> but Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What are you doing? You sleeper, arise and call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. I mean, like, you ever, you ever thought about the fact that Jonah just didn't care what happened to anybody in the ship? I mean, so this squall comes out of nowhere. Everybody else is freaking out. Jonah goes for a nap. Because sin hardens your heart. You stop caring about people. Disobedience puts you in a place where you're the only one that matters. Disobedience isn't just a bad place to be because you're disobeying. It's an incredibly selfish place to be, and nobody likes to be around a disobedient person. Because the more that you walk in disobedience, the more selfish you'll become. All of life becomes about you. There's nothing about the world around you that really matters. It's all internal. Like Jonah we can be in a situation where people all around us are actually experiencing, come on, they're experiencing the fruit of our disobedience. And then we just go down and take a nap. Because the chaos isn't my fault. Technically, it's God's fault. You see where I'm going with this? You see it all the time in, in families whether it's disobedient children, disobedient fathers, disobedient mothers, you see that chaos begins to happen. And typically the one that's making the chaos doesn't care about the chaos. You notice that? The one that's creating a lot of the problems doesn't really care what's happening. Because their disobedience is justified. Because the moment you step into that and you embrace it, you become selfish and you don't care what happens. As long as you get quote unquote what you need. But at the same time, I rarely, if ever, have seen a person walking in disobedience that's actually walking in rest, too. There's almost always some level of anxiety, some level of stress, some level of depression that comes with it. And, and, and let's not call this the judgment of God, because it's easy to say that God's doing all these things. Friend, can I tell you that sin carries its own consequences? Like, if you've been smoking for 60 years and you get diagnosed with lung cancer, don't say that God gave you cancer. That's disingenuous. You gave yourself cancer by doing something that you knew could, could result in that. Most of what we look at as being, oh man, God's just coming down hard. I mean, no, sin carries the weight of its own consequences, one way or the other. If you sleep with someone that's not your wife and your marriage falls apart, don't say God's judging you. Your sin carried the weight of its own consequences. You know what's funny? I didn't think this was going to be a very harsh word. When I put it together, I was like, man, this is going to be great. We're going to talk about rest and all these types of things. I want to encourage you on something. Entering the rest of Jesus is not difficult. But listen to this. Can I get a musician real quick? I want you to listen to this. This is actually moving a, a farther ahead in the... Uh, uh, in the book of Hebrews. This is Hebrews 4, verses 11 to 13. It says, let us, let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Doesn't that sound kind of like an oxymoron? Let's strive to enter rest. Let's do everything possible to enter into a place of rest. 
in some ways, the, 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 the term strive, we typically, we, we typically look at it and say, well, that means work. We need to work really hard to get into a place of rest. No, friend, the moment that you accept Jesus as your Savior, you have entered into rest. The issue, the, the, the striving, the, the thing that we're, that we're pushing hard against is I'm pushing back against that which is natural to me because what's natural to me brings me into a place where there's no rest, where there's no peace, where there's no salvation. I allow myself to drift back to the same type of person that I was before and wonder how I got there. Striving to enter the rest of the Lord is quite simple. I look at my life and I ask myself, do I still look like Egypt? Am I, am I viewing the provision of the Lord as though he owes me something? Is there unbelief in my heart? Is there disobedience in me? Is there something that I'm missing? Friend, I got to tell you, Hard work is going to happen to you, okay? We should be working hard. But there is a rest in Christ. There is a rest available in Jesus. That no matter what you're doing in your work, in your family, in your life, no matter what you're doing for the kingdom, there is a rest that's possible to make it feel like it's not work. How many of you could grab a hold of that this morning? You know, Paul said it this way. He said, whether well-fed or in need, whether I'm living in plenty or I'm living in want, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This entire group of scriptures, what he's talking about is he's saying, no matter what my external circumstances are, I have learned to be content in Christ. There, are, there is a way that, that, that no matter what's happening to me, it doesn't affect what's in me. There is a rest that is available in Jesus that no matter what's happening externally, whether you're on vacation or you're working the hardest that you've ever worked in your entire life, there is a rest that is available. There is a Sabbath, an internal Sabbath that Jesus is to us that we can enter into any time by turning our heart and our affection to him. See, I have to remind myself when I get a little stressed out, I got to remind myself when I get a little bit overwhelmed, that I carry in me a rest that I'm not accessing right now. I have to remind myself that I carry in me a contentment that I haven't accessed. Friend, I gotta tell you, I believe that there is a rest in Jesus that will destroy every depression, that will destroy every stronghold. I believe that there is a power innately in him that no matter what malady that is, is on your life right now, Christ Jesus can break it. Can I tell you that stress, anxiety, depression, all these things, while that might, they might be normal to us, are broken in the power of Jesus. Amen. Come on, this morning, I want to encourage you in this. Whether your resolution this year is to lose weight, whether it's to, you know, uh, you know, renew relationship with people, whatever it is, I can tell you that these resolutions can be fully realized in the rest of Christ. If our primary resolution is this, that no matter what happens this year, I'm going to go after Jesus with everything that I've got. I want to seek the Lord because I want more of the Lord. I want to seek the Lord because I want more of him more than anything else. And I got to tell you, now you guys, most of you know that I, that this past year I've been on a, a, a journey in weight loss and, and, and I'm, I'm still, you know, I'm still going towards those goals. I'm still meeting the goals, but here's the thing is that Weight loss alone cannot satisfy. Health alone cannot satisfy. Wealth alone will not satisfy you. No matter what it is that you're striving towards this year, if you're not also and primarily striving towards a greater revelation of who Jesus is, nothing's gonna satisfy you. And it doesn't matter what you accomplish if you don't accomplish the one thing that matters most. I need more of Jesus. If I don't get that, there'll always be another resolution to change your life. And you'll think to yourself, this is what's gonna do it. 
this year, if I can do this, if I can do that, if I can do this other thing, no matter what it is, you're going to be 60, 70, 80 years old, and there's going to be one more thing that you need to do to get your life right. Friend, I want to tell you this morning that no matter what we're looking at this year, no matter what your goal is, I want to reset your goal. Seek the Lord with all of your heart, your mind, and your soul. Jesus said it this way. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added to you. Let me put it to you this way. Friend, if you're overweight, God knows that you need to lose weight. Okay. If you need to get your finances right, God knows that too. If you need to... If you need to repair relationships with your family, God gets that too. The problem is, is that that cannot be the primary goal of your life. But if you will make the kingdom of God and the person of Jesus the sole goal for this year, he'll give you the strength, he'll give you the peace, he'll give you the rest to accomplish all those other things anyway. Come on, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for the rest of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that there is a rest available in you that surpasses any vacation we've ever been on. It, it surpasses any, uh, any, any amount of contentment that we've ever felt. And Lord, today, we don't want to be people that miss out on your rest. This morning, as we're praying, I just want to, I want to call your attention to something this morning. If you're here today, and, and you recognize that anxiety has been a huge part of your life. Anxiety, depression, uh, even stress. This morning, I, I, want us, I want us to do something. If that's you today, I want you to raise your hand and I'm going to pray for you that the rest of Jesus would come upon you in a fresh way. That the rest of Christ would come upon you in a way that it would, it would, it would, it would destroy your anxiety, it would destroy your stress, and it would lay to rest all of these other things and replace it with the contentment of Jesus. Come on, this morning, Heavenly Father, I thank you for each person here that's responding and saying, I need the rest of Jesus like I've never had it before. I need to be able to get in to your rest, to put to, to, put to rest all of these other things, put to bed all of these other things that have been on my heart, all the stress, all the anxiety, all of the depression, all of these things that, 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 that are natural to us. Lord, I thank you that it's natural to be in your rest. Lord, this morning, those that, are, those that are responding, we just declare right now the rest of heaven over them. We declare right now the rest of heaven over them. Jesus' mighty name.